Thank you, and good morning. Dean Hess, Chancellor Vance, distinguished guests, faculty and staff, parents, family, graduates, welcome. It is an honor to be here with you today as we celebrate not only you and your accomplishments, but today we celebrate with the nation of Liberia as today marks 42 days with no new cases of Ebola. And we continue to pray for the people of Sierra Leone and Guinea as they fight to rid their own countries of Ebola virus disease. And may we continue to strive with them until that goal is met. <clears throat> but today we celebrate you, the Indiana University School of Medicine class of 2015. You have made it. Congratulations. After four of the longest, academically hardest years of your life, you finally made it to this day, commencement. Commencement, as in a beginning. That's right, this is not the end. It is only the beginning. And believe me, when I walked across this stage six years ago, I had no idea what adventures lay in wait for me. This is only the beginning. And what an exciting beginning. 404 new physicians, scientists, and researchers. You've spent the last four years together in this chrysalis known as the IU School of Medicine. And now you are about to stretch out your new wings for the first time. And you'll be doing so in 34 different states. 77 of you, just, just about a quarter of you, will be staying with some facility associated with Indiana University while more than a third of you will stay in the state of Indiana. And as of today, you are officially doctors. Of course, you may have the experience. Of course, you may have the experience like I had when as a resident, your own child will need medical attention and you will expertly diagnose the upper respiratory infection, but your wife or husband will say, don't you think she needs to see a real doctor? <laughs> but as you spread out those wings, still wet with the amniotic fluid of metamorphosis, as one of your own classmates put it, there is no more bumper bowling. This time, it's for real. Real people putting their well-being in your hands. Real families looking to you for an explanation about their loved one's condition. Real people giving you permission to cut their bodies open and fix what is wrong with their insides. Real people whose lives are affected by the decisions you make. The transition to residency has a very steep learning curve. And on July 1st, you will meet it head on. So, be nice to each other. Look around you right now. This network of friends that you've built over the last four years in the anatomy lab, in the library, around the foosball table, at the bar, these are the types of people that will be walking this next road with you. You will all be learning together how to become excellent physicians. So give each other a little bit of grace. And not just over the next year as you fumble through your first days on the job and complete your internships, but as you move through residency and into your chosen careers, be nice to each other. Remember that the specialist you're consulting was once a classmate in a situation just like yours. Or remember that that primary care doctor who's calling you again was once your lab partner or a member of your study group. Remember that this profession is full of a network of friends and treat each other accordingly. 
don't think more of yourself than you ought. And don't think less of your colleague than you ought. Treat each other the way you want to be treated, with grace and professionalism and respect. We are all in this together. Now, some of you may still be stuck on my previous comments, and you haven't heard a word I said since this time it's for real. <laughs> You're sitting there wondering, am I really cut out for this? Have I made the right choice? Maybe I should have gone into PM and R. <laughs> Let me assure you, you have made the right choice, or at least you've made a good one. You are entering the profession of medicine with all its privileges and responsibilities. And while those responsibilities may seem overwhelming at times, they are far outweighed by the privileges. You are going to share in the most intimate parts of your patients' lives. You will share in their moments of tragedy, but you will also share in their moments of greatest joy. You will make a difference in people's lives, and you will make a difference in the world. Do you remember why you decided to go into the medical profession in the first place? I hope you do because, as I have already pointed out, this is only the commencement. But I want all of us to pause here for a moment and to meditate on this question. Why did you want to become a doctor? Each one of you wrote an essay to answer this question when you applied to medical school. If you can't remember today what you wrote those four years ago, or maybe seven or eight years ago if you're graduating with a dual degree today, I sincerely encourage you to go look it up. Next week, after you've recovered from your celebration, pull out your laptop and find that file labeled Med School Admission Essay and read it. My guess is that for 99% of you, you spent a considerable portion of that essay describing how you wanted to serve the underserved, to ease the suffering of the sick and injured, to make a difference in the world. And my guess is that your stated reason for wanting to become a doctor had something to do with compassion. I would also wager that for many of you, as you wrote your application essays for residency, they were probably equally sappy and described your dreams of maturing in your chosen specialty. But here's the deal for most of you. You may have started out this journey with the greatest, most altruistic motives, but the last four years have been so difficult that you can't even remember what you put in that essay. And that's understandable. I mean, you've been focused on learning things like the electron transport chain for ATP production and memorizing all the foramina of the skull, and learning how to do a good shoulder exam, and practicing your patient presentations. You've had a lot on your plate. You haven't had just a whole lot of time to sit and reflect on motives. And I hate to burst your bubble, but for most of you, you are not entering a season of life where you are going, that's going to grant you excess time for introspection. The road of medical education is long, and there are far too many distractions along the way. If you are not intentional about staying on course, you will hit a detour, and not the kind that Chancellor Vance is talking about. You will hit a detour, and without a roadmap to guide you, you will get lost, and you will never make it to your intended destination. And I want to suggest that the reason so many of you wrote about compassion in those essays is not just because that's what students who want to get into medical school say. Rather, many of those essays focus on compassion because compassion is at the heart of the profession of medicine. Compassion, from the Latin to suffer with. In the ancient Greek, the verb to have compassion on comes from the word splenizomai, to be moved in the inward parts. It's where we get our word splanknik. Compassion is it's, it's a visceral image. It doesn't mean to feel sorry for somebody or to have pity on or to give charity to. Compassion means to be moved in your inward parts, to relinquish your own right to comfort 
and safety and to step into the suffering of another. And isn't that exactly what physicians do? We give up the comfort of a nine to five, Monday to Friday job in order to enter into the suffering of others. We give up our nights and weekends to be on call for other people's emergencies. We take care of people with deadly disease despite the risk to our own health. When everyone else is running away in fear, we stay to help, to offer healing and hope. I moved to Liberia with my family in October of 2013 because within this general calling of compassion that we all share as physicians, I felt a unique calling to use my skills to practice my profession in a place with the greatest of need, among the most vulnerable people. It had nothing to do with Ebola. But as my brother put it, when I moved to Liberia, there were already plenty of other diseases there with no vaccines, no cures, and limited treatment. Ebola really didn't change any of that. So when the Ebola outbreak began in March of 2014, we began making preparations in case the disease came to our hospital. And in June of that year, when we began to see our first cases, we took pride in caring for those victims. In the first seven weeks of treating patients with Ebola, we had only one survivor. One survivor and nearly 20 deaths. But even in the face of such devastating odds, we knew that we, what we were doing was right. Losing so many patients certainly was difficult. But it didn't make me feel like a failure as a physician because I had learned that there's a lot more to being a physician than curing illness. In fact, that isn't even the most important thing we do. The most important thing we do is to enter into the suffering of others. And in the midst of what was becoming the worst Ebola epidemic in history, we were showing compassion to people during the most desperate and trying times of their lives through the protection of Tyvek suits and two pairs of gloves, we were able to hold the hands of people as they died, to offer dignity in the face of humiliating circumstances, to treat with respect the dying and the dead, while the rest of the world turned a blind eye. And in my opinion, that made those weeks, those difficult weeks of my career, a success. And even if you disagree with me about that, you have to admit that it was that harrowing season of my career that gained me an invitation to speak at the graduation ceremony for my alma mater. <laughs> and speaking of becoming famous, maybe some of you will become famous someday. Maybe you'll be invited back to Indianapolis to speak to a future graduating class of physicians. But let me give you this piece of advice. If you want to become famous, do it by being an excellent doctor, not by becoming a deathly ill patient. <laughs> so I challenge each of you, find your medical school application essay and read it. Do you still have the same goals are you still the same person? Do you want to once again be the person you were back then? Becoming who you want to be doesn't happen by accident. It takes intention and effort and patience. So don't let the world beat you down. Don't let residency wear you out. Don't let the choices you made as a third year medical student rope you into a life of misery. You've made a good choice to become a physician, but your plan can change. And if you decide after a year of general surgery that you'd really rather be a psychiatrist, then have the courage to make that change. Because what are the chances that a miserable, bitter, regretful doctor of any kind will be a good physician for his or her patients? And your patients deserve a good physician. So in closing, let's review. I wish I had a, a handy acronym for you at this point, but I was never, that was never my role in the study group. I was never the acronym guy. 
So you'll just have to grab onto one or two of these points and hope for the best. Number one, this is just the beginning. Number two, be nice to each other. Number three, you've made a good decision. Number four, it's never too late to make a change. Number five, being a good physician is primarily about having compassion. Number six, remember why you wanted to become a doctor in the first place. And number seven, congratulations, you are now a real doctor, <laughs> no matter what my wife says. Now go out there and make the world a better place. Because what the world desperately needs right now is more physicians who remember what they put in their application essays. Thank you. Thank you. We would be remiss in not recognizing Dr. Brantley for his extraordinary efforts both here and abroad. What Dr. Brantley experienced is truly the epitome of heroics in medicine, working under the most extreme of conditions at his own peril in order to extend aid to those suffering around him. Dr. Brantley, your enduring spirit exemplifies the kind of dedication, commitment, and resilience that we believe all of our graduates are capable of. You inspire not just our students, but their families, friends, and scores of others who will never look at this disease nor the individuals afflicted by it the same again. Whenever as physicians we can help unburden and enlighten individuals through the work that we do, the world becomes a better place for all of us. You've helped to demonstrate that through your actions. And so it is my honor on behalf of Indiana University to celebrate you for your professional accomplishments. To recognize distinctions such as yours, the university established the Thomas Hart Benton Medallion. First given in 1986, the bronze medal features the Benton mural, which is located in the IU Auditorium in Bloomington. The reverse side has the seal of the university. It symbolizes the aspirations and ideals that are the foundation of the search for knowledge. And so, by the authority vested in me by the trustees of Indiana University and in acknowledgement of all that you have done and continue to do as an alumnus of this university, I present to you, Dr. Brantley, the Thomas Hart Benton Medallion. Congratulations. Thank you.